Hi, everyone. My name is Luke Bennett. I'm the Conservation Coordinator for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for tonight's webinar hosted by the Noose River Hawks, who are based out of Wake Forest. Um, and they do phenomenal conservation work for their local environment and community. Um, if you're interested in joining the chapter or simply learning more about the Noose River Hawks, please feel free to send me an email um, and I'll be sure to connect you with one of their, their great chapter leaders. Um, Tonight we have Gabriella Garrison joining us to speak about pollinators um, and conservation efforts in North Carolina. Um, Gabrielle is currently the Eastern Piedmont Conservation Coordinator for the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. She works with developers, consultants, and government agencies to promote ecologically friendly solutions and minimize impact to wildlife in a developing landscape. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in zoology with a minor in forestry from NC State and a Master of Science degree in wildlife science from Virginia Tech. Uh, in 2017, she helped form the, the, um, the NC Pollinator Conservation Alliance, a partnership of over 25 conservation agencies and organization, organizations, including the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, uh, that works to promote pollinator and habitat, habitat conservation across the state. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please feel free to type those into the Q&A, uh, or you can type them into the chat. Uh, both of those can be found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll try to get to those questions um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, and with that, I will now pass it over to Gabriella. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Luke. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Let me know when you see it. Looks good to me. Yep. All good. All right. Well, thanks everyone for having me here tonight. Um, I'm talking about one of my most favorite things to talk about. So I always have to put a timer on to make sure I don't talk for too long so that I have plenty of time for questions. And I did this presentation a couple of years ago, but I just did it on pollinators. So I thought just to switch it up a little bit tonight, I would talk a little bit initially about beneficial insects, which encompasses a whole lot more than just pollinators, and then kind of hone in on some bees and butterflies and a few other things before I wrap it up. So I always like to ask the question, how many insect species are there? Because I think a lot of people think that there are much fewer numbers than there actually are. And I like asking this question in person because then I can kind of gauge the audience to see what people think. But since I can't do that, I'll go ahead and tell you the answer. The number of living species across the globe is estimated at 30 million species. And that's just an estimate, which means it's probably a lot more than 30 million species. In this country, the number is about 91,000, but again, the actual count is likely much higher. And that's pretty well expected just because so many insects, most insects are so small, they have really different life cycles. Some insects are only above the ground or visible to our eyes for a really short amount of time. So it's really hard studying and figuring out what we actually have that we're working with. And so I think everybody in this audience probably knows, but I always like to say insects are a major component of biodiversity. Over half of the described species on the planet are insects. And so plants and insects are sort of the base of all the food chain, right? Without plants and insects, we wouldn't have all the taxa above, the whole food chain would collapse. So how do insects benefit people? Well, there are a lot of different ways, but probably the most familiar way is that insects pollinate crops, right? They also act as pest suppressants, which reduces chemical use, which is something that we like because chemical use overall is negative, is detrimental. So I really like this picture on the bottom left-hand corner of the screen of this tomato hornworm. And you might ask, what are all those little white things on this little tomato hornworm caterpillar? And those are wasp larvae. So they're feeding on this pest caterpillar that we don't like to see on our crops. Uh, insects build healthy soils. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but I think a lot of people are familiar with dung beetles. They do a lot of work and they're really underestimated and underrepresented by how valuable they are. And then of course, recreation. Don't know about you, but I could spend hours in the woods chasing insects, taking pictures, just trying to get a closer look. So I always categorize insects into these four major groups. We've sort of touched on most of them just now, but they are pollination, decomposition, predation, and food for wildlife. And so we're briefly going to talk about each of those categories before we, like I said before, hone in a little more specifically on pollinators in North Carolina. So decomposers, what do they do? Well, they feed on dead animals, right? 
but they also feed on a lot of other things that most people aren't aware of. They feed on the excrement of other animals. And they feed on lots of things in your yard that you might not even be aware of, like leaves, garden waste, any type of woody debris, tree limbs, things like that. So there's a whole wide range of animals that fall into this group, like beetles. So these are burying beetles in the bottom right-hand corner. Ants, fly larvae, mites, springtails. This is a springtail in the upper left-hand corner, right-hand left-hand corner, excuse me. These are blowfly larvae. And there's been a lot of research done on dung beetles in particular, and scientists have shown that dung beetles can actually carry a hundred times the weight of their body. So it's pretty impressive when you think about this tiny little beetle and how much they can accomplish in their life. So the next group, let's talk about predators. I think this might be one of my favorite groups because the insects in this group are so fascinating to me. So we have on the left of your screen, a robber fly with a bumblebee. And even though I love bumblebees, I love watching robber flies in action. They're just amazing predators. A cicada killer wasp up here on the top of your screen. And then on the right, a native praying mantis. We do have a problem with invasive non-native praying mantids, but this one on the right is a praying mantis that is supposed to be here. And there have been a lot of studies that have shown that these native predator and parasitoid insects actually provide a huge amount of pest control to the tune of at least four and a half billion dollars annually in this country alone. So that's really important for us because we're always looking for a way to reduce insecticides and herbicide use. So we tell people that if you create habitat that attracts these native predators, then you should really have to rely minimally on any kind of chemical use in your garden. So here are some examples of some predators, and this is just a really short list of what you would actually count as a predator. So assassin bugs, big-eyed bugs, damsel bugs, minute pirate bugs, mantis like we talked about, lace wings. These are lace wings in the bottom left-hand corner. And if you have milkweed in your yard, and I wish I could tell you to raise your hand if you've ever seen this, but if you have milkweed in your yard, oftentimes on the underside of the leaf, you'll see these little white egg-looking structures hanging from a thread. And those are the eggs of a lacewing. And they eat what? They eat the aphids on the milkweed. So we love the lacewings because they're doing the work for us. Flower flies and hoverflies, one larva from a flower fly or a hoverfly in one day can eat 50 aphids. So again, that's a really powerful little tiny larva that can do a lot of work for us. And then predatory and parasitoid wasps. So then the last category, food for wildlife. I use this example because I feel like this is something that a lot of people can relate to because they love birds. Everybody loves birds, right? Everybody always wants birds in their backyard. And maybe it's a little known fact, but probably not as much as it used to be, thanks to Dr. Doug Calamy, but caterpillars are a really important food source for baby birds. In fact, most baby birds in this country, that is the only thing they eat. Now, why is that? Well, they're really high in a lot of important sources of protein and vitamins and minerals and all kinds of things that they need to grow. But another reason why they're so popular is they're so soft and squishy. So it's really easy for the mom and the dad birds to squish the caterpillars down the throats of the little baby birds. So they're really, really important food sources, along with a lot of other different types of insects as well. I've actually seen merlins, this is pretty cool, hunting, diving through the air and catching dragonflies and other um, butterflies and things like that. So it's pretty neat to watch what a lot of these birds eat. So this was in my backyard a couple of years ago. It was actually a November day, kind of similar to today, not too hot, not too cold during the day. And I was walking around and I saw this hole in the ground. I'm like, what is that hole in the ground? And what is all that kind of comb-like nesting material? Well, it turns out that that was a yellow jacket nest that had been hanging out in my backyard unbeknownst to me and something dug it up. And so in my backyard, it was probably a raccoon. I don't think it was any of those other things, probably a raccoon most likely, but it's pretty common for mammals to eat the larvae of different types of bees and wasps. And why is that? Because they have a tremendous amount of protein. So they can contain up to 77 grams of protein per 100 grams of weight. So the stinging that they might endure as a result of digging up that nest is probably very minimal compared to the protein benefit that they get from eating those larvae. 
So like I said, let's talk a little bit about pollinator diversity in North Carolina because we have a tremendous diversity here. We have over 550 species of native bees. That number kind of varies depending on which entomologist you're talking to, but that's a pretty good number of what we have here. We have over 2,800 species of moths and the number of that is probably much higher, but that's a good baseline to start with. We have 177 species of butterflies. We have one bird, of course, our hummingbird, and then an unknown number of other insect pollinators to include wasps, flies, beetles, things that we don't necessarily think as pollinators, but actually do a lot of work. And those are the species that are really hard to study because they're not above the ground very often. They can be really small, so it's sort of hard to track them. I always like to ask people if they can tell the difference between a bee, a fly, and a wasp. And again, if I was standing in front of you, I would ask you to tell me some things that you noticed, and I'd ask you to tell me which is the bee, which is the fly, and which is the wasp. But in this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you. So the first one here is the bee. And you can tell because it's really, or she, she's really furry because females are the ones that collect pollen. And so they have to have these pollen collecting hairs on their body. If you looked at these hairs under a microscope, it almost looked like a feather. They're called complex branch hairs because of how they branch out. Most other insects, in fact, really no other insects have these complex branch hairs on their body. So pretty good chance if you see a furry fluffy insect, it's probably a bee. Well, what about this next critter? This is a fly. And you can see that this fly has really large eyes, right? Most flies, their eyes probably take up about 80% of their body. They also, their body, excuse me, their head. They also have really short antennae. If you look at bees, this picture over here, you can see how long the antenna are. And so flies always have little short stubby, almost non-existent antenna. And then they only have two wings. I didn't have a good picture to show you on the bee, but bees have four wings. And that can be sometimes hard to tell when they're flying around because they don't often settle long enough on a leaf to take such a good picture like this one. But bees have two wings, wasps and, I'm oh, sorry, bees have four wings, flies have two wings, wasps have four wings. So this last guy right here, this is a wasp. This is our cicada killer wasp. And I think most people know that wasps have a sort of smoother, skinnier appearance. They don't tend to have those pollen collecting hairs. And they have that thin waist, that wasp waist that people like to say. Um, and so there are always exceptions to the rule though, because there are some wasps that do have hair on their legs that do have a furry body. But for the most part, wasps have a smoother appearance and they have that long elongated thin waist. So let's talk a little bit more about native bees, just because native bees are probably the most efficient pollinators that we have. They come in a range of size, shapes, colors. They have all kinds of different foraging habitats. They have lots of different types of nesting behaviors. And I really like this picture here on the right because it shows you the differences in size of all these bees relative to each other. So you can see how there's some mason bees down here that are pretty small. There's some sweat bees that are pretty small. Bumblebees are really large. There's a carpenter bee on here too. So it's really neat to see the diversity of just bees that we have in the state, not to even mention bees in other states that are different. And a lot of people don't know that bees are actually descended from wasps. So millions of years ago, they were just wasps. And then wasps decided there was a species of wasp one day that decided to try its luck at eating some pollen and he liked that pretty good. And she decided to take some to her nest for her young and from there diverged the line of bees. So we like to call bees our vegetarian wasps, but you can imagine that they're pretty closely related. Another maybe lesser known fact is that males can't sting only females can sting. So if you're looking at a bee, there's only a 50-50 chance that you're gonna get stung. And I'll go ahead and tell you too, that most of our native bees are pretty docile. And I've spent a lot of time chasing after bees, netting them, kind of sort of harassing them. And I've only been stung a few times. And that was probably pretty well deserved because I had them in a net and I was trying to put them into a little container. But the sting is pretty short lived. I've never been stung by a honeybee, but as I understand it, it's pretty painful and it lasts, could last a couple of days, but that's not been my experience when I've been stung by a native bee. And then, like I mentioned just a minute ago, female bees, they gather pollen to feed their brood. 
they eat nectar themselves to sustain themselves. And nectar is high in carbs and amino acids and pollen is really valuable for its proteins and its lipids. But I always like to briefly discuss the difference between honeybees and native bees because I think a lot of people tend to lump them together and they're actually quite different. So I just kind of pointed out some of the more obvious differences. So honeybees, I think most people know, nest in hives. Everybody sees the big boxes, the hives that you can move around. Whereas native bees are either ground nesters, 70% of our native bees nest in the ground, and 30% are cavity nesters. So whether that's in a tube in a bee house or a little hidey hole in the ground, a little burrow in the ground, that's where they'll be. Honeybees have a pretty, um, a pretty intense social structure, whereas most native bees are solitary. It's just the mom that's taking care of the brood of feeding them. And then honeybees, the hive can persist from year to year and native bees for the most part all have an annual life cycle. So they're above the ground or out of their cavity at one point during the year. And then the female will die and the eggs will develop in the cavity or in the ground and they won't emerge until next year. And so with that in mind, I always like to throw out there that native bees, there's actually research suggesting that they are more efficient pollinators than honeybees. And I didn't mention just now, which I should have, honeybees are not actually native to the United States. They were actually brought over, gosh, four or 500 years ago from Europe. Um, and that's where they're actually native. So they're not supposed to be here on the landscape, but they've been here quite a long time. So sometimes people call them naturalized. But native bees, it makes sense then, because they are supposed to be on the landscape, that they're more efficient at pollinating. And so I really like this figure that um, with one acre of apples, it takes 250 mason bees to pollinate versus two hives of honeybees to pollinate. And if you know anything about honeybees, you would tell me that there could be several thousand bees in one hive. So you multiply that times two, you have several thousand bees to pollinate one acre of apples versus 250 little mason bees that can do the same job. So if you provide them with natural habitat where they can nest, then they're gonna provide you with some really good pollination service. Another thing is that a lot of our species of native bees are active in cooler and rainy conditions. If I'm out in the woods and it's eight or nine in the morning and it's kind of drizzly and maybe 65, 70 degrees, I tend to start seeing bumblebees flitting around, but I don't tend to see the honeybees appear until about 11 or 12. So they like to sleep in a little bit until the weather clears up. And then another really cool thing is that native bees are capable of buzz pollination. So essentially, and not all native bees, just some like bumblebees, they will grab onto a flower that doesn't have the pollen immediately available and they'll shake that flower with their flight muscles to get the pollen, to get the flower to release the pollen. And to demonstrate that, I have a video that's pretty short, but it's kind of neat. So I'm gonna see if it will play. Uh-oh, we tested this. Let's see, yay, okay. This buzzing is a secret password, the key to a lock. What this bumblebee is after is pollen. Bumblebees eat pollen, it's high in protein. But the flower doesn't want to give it to just anyone, so it hides it away in those bright yellow anthers. For a flower, that's unusual. Most flowers keep their pollen on the outside of the anther, which is the male part of the flower. Pollen is basically sperm for plants. Most flowers make sugary nectar too. They use it as bait to attract bees and other pollinators, which get coated with pollen along the way. And since bees are messy, they inadvertently scatter some of that pollen onto the female part of the next flower they visit. That's how most flowers have sex. But this type of flower doesn't offer nectar. The only way to get to its pollen is through those tiny pores at the ends. But the bumblebee knows just what to do. It wraps its legs around the flower and bites down on the anthers, that male part of the flower. <laughs> 
See those wings shaking? Normally, the bumblebee uses those powerful muscles to flap its wings. That's what makes the buzzing sound when they fly. But here, those muscles vibrate its whole body. So hard and fast that it makes a louder, higher pitched buzz. This vibration shakes up the pollen trapped inside the anthers until it's out all over the bumblebee. It's called buzz pollination, and you don't need a bumblebee to do it. A tuning fork will do. The bumblebee grooms the pollen down into sticky sacks on its legs, carries it back to the hive. Only a few types of pollinators, like bumblebees, are capable of buzz pollination. Honeybees can't do it. This field is kind of a free-for-all. Think Las Vegas buffet. Tons of food, but long lines. Lots of competition. Buzz pollination is more like a private club. By only permitting pollinators that know the secret knock, the flower ups the chances that its pollen will end up on flowers from the same club, the same species. The bumblebee? Well, sure, it has to work a little harder, and there's no sweet nectar. But it's a reliable pollen stash that almost no one else has access to. Tomatoes, potatoes, blueberries. All of these need buzz pollination to reproduce. Much of the food we eat owes its existence to that buzz. Our secret password here at Deep Look? I'll be honest, it's that subscribe button. Clicking subscribe releases a cloud of goodwill. Alrighty. Alright, I hope you guys like that video. I'm really excited that it worked because it only works 50% of the time during presentations. Alright, so let's talk about nesting habits. So like I mentioned, most of our native bees are ground nesters. And so in the spring, oftentimes you'll see these mounds with the holes on top and the bees will emerge and the males will emerge first and they'll fly really close to the surface waiting for the females to emerge so they can mate. That really freaks people out because they think that it's a yellow jacket or something that's gonna sting them. And so I get a lot of calls in the spring and in the summer asking what's going on with this? How can I make them go away? Can I pour gasoline in the holes? And we always try to explain what the holes are and what the insects are and that they're really good. And that within a couple of weeks, once those bees have mated and the females have dug more tunnels and laid eggs for her young, the adults will die off. And then the young will develop for the rest of the year. So the female never actually meets her young. She collects pollen and nectar and she rolls it up into a pollen ball and she drops it in a chamber. And so over here, you can sort of see that illustration. The female will dig these tunnels and each little chamber gets its own pollen ball and each pollen ball gets an egg laid on it. And when the female is done, she'll seal up the chambers and she'll seal up the top of this tunnel right here. And then she'll die off because her work is done. And then those eggs will hatch and will eat the pollen ball that the mom provisioned for them. And they'll spend the rest of the year developing and they'll emerge the following year. So most of these species of bees only have a very limited time either above the ground or outside of their cavity. And I really like this picture as well because it demonstrates the difference between a bee nest and a yellow jacket nest. And so if you have something coming up from a hole in the ground, if you have a bunch of different insects coming out of the same hole going in and out, that is more than likely some kind of yellow jacket or some kind of wasp nest. A solitary bee is only ever gonna have one bee going in and out of the hole. Every now and then you'll have a species that might share this entrance tunnel, but for the most part, you're only gonna see one bee per hole. And some examples of these ground nesters are mining bees, cellophane bees, and sweat bees, which are those really pretty green metallic bees that we often see flying around. And so here's the little diagram, basically what I just talked about. Here is the female bee above ground for three or four weeks out of the year. She's collecting provisions for her young. 
Here is the little chamber where she rests her pollen ball and a pollen ball can take sometimes 40 or 50 visits, different visits to a flower. So it's a lot of work just to collect one pollen ball. So then down here, she'll lay her egg on the pollen ball. And at this point, she'll seal off the chamber so that nothing can get to that egg and to the larva or the egg. And then this is where the, excuse me, the egg will hatch and turn into a larva and then it'll pupate. And then next year, the bee emerges and starts the cycle all over again. So then what about the other bees that don't nest in the ground? Well, these are our cavity nesters, like carpenter bees. I'm sure most people have carpenter bees. Bumblebees that we just saw that video on, leaf cutting bees, mason bees. And so their nesting setup is pretty similar to the ground nesting bees, except it's in a cavity. So a lot of people like to put out bee hotels, right? And so if you have a bee hotel, then you have a long tube in the bee hotel. And this is what's going on. The female, she'll start at the very end of the tube and she'll deposit her pollen ball, she'll lay the egg, the egg will turn into a larva, and then it'll pupate. So there can be varying stages of development in the one stem, but they'll all stay here for the remainder of the year until the following year when they'll emerge from the stem and they'll be an adult and start the whole cycle over again. Now bumblebees are a little bit different. I think my next slide, yes, I have the life cycle of a bumblebee. And so what happens is that a queen I'm going to kind of start a little backwards. So new queens are produced in a colony in the late summer or early fall. And they will find a male to mate with. So they mate in the fall and then they go find a little hidey hole. And that's where they will overwinter, hopefully successfully. Hopefully nothing will disturb them. The next spring, that queen, she'll emerge and she'll be all by herself. She won't have a colony. And her first order of business is going to be to find pollen and nectar to sustain herself and to give her energy to start a new colony. So that's what's happening here. She has found a colony and she's created what's known as a wax pot. And that's where she'll deposit her provisions for her eggs, whether it be the pollen and the nectar all combined together, and she'll start laying eggs. And so in early spring, we're seeing lots of queens flying around, but they're really vulnerable because they're large. Everything sees them and they're kind of slow moving because they're so large. So what they need to do is hurry up and find a little cavity or hidey hole, start laying eggs so that the first generation of workers can hatch. Then the queen will stay in her burrow with her colony and the workers will go out and start doing all of the foraging. So that's what's happening here. She has started to lay workers. These are all females. And then at some point in the late summer, fall, there's some cue, whether it be a change in temperature or if it's the shortening of days, there's some cue that tells that queen that she needs to start laying eggs to produce new queens and males. Because up to this point in midsummer, she's only been producing female workers. So when that cue hits, then she'll shift from producing workers to producing males and new queens. And that's when the new queens will emerge, mate with a male, and the cycle kind of starts over again. I hope that makes sense. It's a little convoluted, but it makes sense in my mind. So I'm gonna shift now to butterflies just because I know a lot of people love butterflies and everybody probably knows their life cycle. It's just similar to a bee. There's an egg, there's a larva, there's a pupa, and then there's an adult. But the reason that I included this life cycle is because I have a story of when I was working with an HOA in Raleigh. This is a couple of years ago. And they really wanted to have monarch butterflies. So they called me up and said, what can I do? We wanna have monarch butterflies. And I said, okay, well, to have monarch butterflies, you need to have good nectar sources, right? So you need to plant flowers that will provide nectar sources, but most importantly, you need to provide larval host habitat, which is milkweed. So I said, you need to make sure that you have good amounts of milkweed for the caterpillars to eat. They said, okay, we're on it. And I said, you don't wanna use any kind of chemical or pesticide or herbicide. You want it to be completely clean and organic. And I said, got it. So they planted all the milkweed and a year or two went by and they weren't getting monarchs and they were getting kind of frustrated because they didn't understand. And so I said, well, you know, sometimes it takes a couple of years for the monarchs to find the milkweed. So another year goes by and they call me back up and they said, look, we're doing all the work. We're planting the milkweed. We're keeping it really clean. We're not applying any chemicals. We're even going around and we're smushing all the worms that are eating all the leaves up. And I said, oh no, 
tell me what the worms look like. And sure enough, they sent me a picture and that's what they were smushing because they didn't understand the life cycle of the larva, the caterpillar having to eat those leaves. They just thought that they got this beautiful adult butterfly. So I always try to emphasize the importance of understanding the life cycle and understanding what each stage of the life cycle needs to survive. I don't, I didn't talk too much about moths because at this point I felt like I was starting to get a little bogged down in my presentation and I didn't want to talk for two hours, but moths could be a whole presentation in themselves. They're beautiful. Um, and so this is a really cool picture that shows a few of the differences between moths and butterflies. And some of you, all of you might already know this, but one of the easier ways to tell a butterfly from a moth is that all butterflies have a little club at the end of their antennae. Moths can have feathered antenna or they can be layered. They're just fuzzy. They're usually a little bit buried. They tend to have thicker fuzzy bodies like this beautiful luna moth on the left hand side. Butterflies tend to have slicker, smoother bodies, but sometimes their abdominal, their abdomen area can be a little furry. Moths are typically active at night and butterflies are active during the day. Moths, of course, make a cocoon, which has silk kind of interwoven into it or some kind of silk-like structure. Butterflies will make a chrysalis, which is usually smoother and harder. And then moths, when they rest on a leaf or a flower, their wings are typically open. But butterflies, their wings are typically closed, um, which is kind of cool too, because oftentimes the underside of a butterfly's wing looks completely different than the top side. So it's neat to see that variety. And of course, in nature, there are always exceptions to this rule, but these are some good generalities to follow. And then I thought it might be neat just to throw in a couple of fun facts about butterflies. So if you ever touch or pick up a butterfly, when you look at your finger, sometimes you might have a little bit of, um, kind of looks like soot almost, but it, it brushes off on your finger and those are scales. And so butterfly wings are covered in thousands and thousands of tiny little overlapping scales. Butterflies can smell with their antennae and they have nerve cells on their feet to identify host plant leaves, but that's not the only way they find their host plants. They rely on sight um, and smell and then touching with their feet to find the host plant. So it's not just one thing in particular that allows them to find their host plant, which makes sense because, I mean, that would be pretty amazing if they only had to rely on sight, um, but they rely on a combination of all three of those senses to be able to find their host plant. Male butterflies congregate at puddles, moist soils, animal scat, and more. And a lot of people see this and they don't know why they do it. And they don't know that it's mostly males. And the reason is they're looking for salts and minerals because that helps them in sperm production. So it's called puddling. So if you're driving down the road and you see a bunch of butterflies congregating at a puddle, they're probably all male butterflies. And then finally, most butterflies, not most, many butterflies do not migrate and instead spend the winters here in a kind of sheltered area as a caterpillar, a chrysalis, or an adult. It kind of just depends on the species, but a lot of butterflies, that's what they'll do. And so that's why we always tell people, like you might already know, to leave the leaves because that's where a lot of butterflies and moths will hang out over the winter under their leaves. That's a really protective cover for them, sometimes in between the bark on trees. So any kind of yard debris is going to be good protection for butterflies, moths, and a whole host of other different types of insects. And so why are pollinators important? Why do we rely on them so much? Well, this is your typical grocery store. This is what your produce section would look like with bees. This is what we take for granted sometimes. If you take away the bees, this is what your produce section would look like. So it's pretty depleted, right? And this is the list of removed products. This isn't everything, but these are kind of the more common things that you might find that you might enjoy. And I'm I feel like it's pretty safe to guess that most everybody has at least a couple of things on here that they really love and that they like to eat. And so from an economical standpoint, agricultural standpoint, pollinators are really important, but why are they important to wildlife? Well, over 80% of our flowering plants rely on pollinators. So without pollinators, we wouldn't have those flowering plants. And in fact, there are some places in other parts of the world where they have to hand pollinate their flowers because 
the pollinators have been depleted for so many various reasons that they've been relegated to hand pollinating flowers. I've done that for some endangered species flowers, um, endangered plants in my neck of the woods just because of some research and other things we were doing. And I can tell you, it is incredibly time intensive. And so here's just some examples. I thought I'd list out a few examples of some species that rely on pollinators that are incredibly valuable to wildlife. So cherries, black cherries, if anybody has anything in the prunus genes, you'll know that they're always so valuable to wildlife. So for instance, 84 species of birds feed on the fruits of black cherries or cherries in the prunus genus. 40 species of mammals feed on the fruits and other plant parts. Dogwoods host or feed, have 93 species of birds that feed on the droops and 20 species of mammals at least that feed on the droops and other plant parts. And some other examples of plants that are incredibly valuable to wildlife that are pollinated by insects are persimmon, sumac, wax myrtle, viburnum, vaccinium, chokeberry. This list could go on and on and on. So lots of value to wildlife from a pollinator perspective. So what are some threats? I said threats to native bee populations, but really this extends to most pollinators. Some threats include insecticides. I don't think that that's an underestimated fact. Most people know that. And any other kind of pesticide, even if there's not a direct detriment to insects from a chemical, there's oftentimes indirect detriment. So it, there's always going to be some kind of um, relationship that has a negative impact on insects. Nest site disturbance. So like I mentioned, most of our native bees nest in the ground. So if you're tilling or construction for a new subdivision, any kind of ground disturbance is going to kill off a lot of bees. A lot of wasp nests in the ground, a lot of beetles are in the ground. So any kind of disturbance to the ground can be really detrimental to insect populations. Flowerless landscapes. A lot of people have so much value on green lawns keep the mode short and they think all green is good. That's really actually not the case at all. Any kind of green lawn that just has a monoculture that just has fescue or Bermuda grass, that's barren. That provides no value to any of our insects. So I really kind of shudder a little bit when people say that all green is good because that's really not the case at all. If you have a landscape without flowers, you're gonna have a landscape without most types of insects, especially bees. Habitat fragmentation, that's a big one for any wildlife in general, but if you think about these critters, they're not very big, so they don't fly very far. And oftentimes, the smaller the bee, the less distance that it can fly. So if you have a very fragmented landscape, you're going to have bees that aren't going to be able to find their way to forage, and they're not going to be able to survive there. Pathogens, there's lots of disease, especially with different species of insects that are non-native being introduced from other places spreading diseases to our native bees, that's very problematic. Climate change, that there's a lot of evidence that is starting to surface that's showing that climate change is having a huge impact on our insects. And if you think about it, each winter here, we're having in February, I don't know about y'all, but I start seeing things bloom earlier and earlier because it's so warm in February. And the bees and the insects, they're not emerged yet from their winter slumber to start foraging. And oftentimes when they do emerge, there's nothing there anymore because the bloom has already passed and vice versa. Sometimes it's getting so warm that the bees are emerging early and they come out and none of the flowers have bloomed yet so they don't have anything to eat. So that really close tied relationship is being altered. And then competition from honeybees, I won't talk about this too much, but there is a lot of evidence now that suggests that honeybees are out competing native bees for forage. And it's not anything as black and white as they're sitting on the flower battling each other. It's more a game of numbers. So remember I talked about you might have two or 3,000 honeybees in a hive, and then you have our solitary bees. Even bumblebee colonies usually don't have more than 100 or 150 bees. So if you place a hive in the middle of the woods, you have to find forage for 3,000 honeybees potentially. They're going to win when it comes to the amount of pollen and nectar that they can find. So by the time one of our little solitary bees finds it, it's probably going to be depleted just because of the numbers of honeybees that have already foraged there. So we know all these things are happening. What are we doing to try to combat some of these issues? So 
like I, Luke mentioned initially, we formed several years ago, this group called the North Carolina Pollinator Conservation Alliance. And it's essentially a partnership of over 20 organizations, including the Wildlife Federation, that all have interest in pollinator conservation. So my organization, organization, the Wildlife Resources Commission, we are doing pollinator work. The Wildlife Federation was doing pollinator work. The zoo was doing pollinator work. And we were doing it all independently of each other. And we thought, hey, we all have the same end goal. We're all in the same state. Why don't we merge what we're doing? Why don't we talk with each other, share ideas, share funding sources to accomplish more as an organized group? And that's what we did. And so these are the active groups right now in our partnership that you can see here below. And I'm going to talk just briefly um, about a few of the larger projects that we're working on now. So outreach is really our bread and butter. That's really what we try to do the most. Things like presenting to different groups, educating about pollinators and native bees and, and habitat work and native plants. And so I put down Bugfest just because there's such a huge number of people that come through Bugfest. This last year in September in Raleigh, we had 19,000 people that came through Bugfest in one day. It's really an amazing event. If you haven't been, you need to go next September. They close the roads down around the Museum of Natural Sciences. They have all kinds of exhibits and fun, cool things for kids and adults alike to do. So we always try to have a table there. And then we've been hosting pollinator field days, both at NCDA research stations for the public. And we've also been working with some of our private landowners to have pollinator field days on their property where we invite people to come out and to learn about the habitat work we've done there and also learn about bee and wasp and fly ID. And so we'll give people basically nets like in this picture right here, and they'll go out and catch what they can catch and they'll come back and we'll identify it together. And it really gives people enjoyment to be able to put a name on what they're catching instead of just saying, oh, that's some green shiny insect. So outreach is probably one of the most important things that we do. We have over the last two years, like everybody else, pivoted and done a lot of webinars. So we have a YouTube channel with um, kind of a, a host of different types of themed webinars that we thought people might find interesting. We have a partnership with BASF up there in RTP where they are growing milkweed for us in their greenhouse um, at no cost. And there's no chemical, it's all organic. And basically we distribute it to people all across the state. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong at the end, but I'm pretty sure that some of the Wildlife Federation chapters, maybe even um, the News River Hawks has hopefully been able to benefit from this. And this is something we've been doing since 2020. And these are roughly the numbers of stems that we've planted across the state. And we're hoping that we'll be able to do it in the coming years as well. It's such a great opportunity to extend the importance of milkweed and to get it into the hands of landowners that might not have been able to get it normally, especially sometimes when there's a shortage of milkweed grown in nurseries. It can get really expensive. So this is a program that we're really excited about because it's getting a lot of milkweed in the ground. And we give it to a variety of people, like I've mentioned here, not just private landowners, but we've given it to schools, to churches, to community gardens. Um, we've worked with some nonprofits. So it's, it's a really cool program that I hope we're able to keep doing into the future. Um, and then I'll just briefly touch on, this is wrapping up. We finished our fourth year this summer, but we wanted to look at what our baseline bee diversity was on game lands across the state. So game lands are state-owned lands that the Wildlife Resources Commission manages. And even though they're called game lands, they're not specifically intended for hunting. They're intended for all forms of recreation. And we really wanted to understand what we had as climate change is happening and other, other things are happening out of our control. We wanted to know what we had now so that in five or 10 years, we can see if we're sort of at a constant with how we're managing, if we're managing well and keeping healthy populations of bees, or if bee populations are declining, if diversity is declining, and that will tell us if we're managing inappropriately. So right now, one of our primary management tools on game lands, and I feel like it's pretty fair to say most state-owned and federal-owned lands, one of the primary uh, management tools is prescribed fire. So we were looking at A, 
what bees do we even have on our game lands? And B, when we burn, what's the impact of that fire on native bees? So we're trying to figure out that relationship to determine if prescribed fire is still a good way to move forward for management. So like I said, we just finished our fourth year, our last year, and we're gonna start crunching a bunch of data. And then the last project that I'm super excited about is our bumblebee atlas. So Xerces is the leading partner in this. They have several bumblebee atlases out west in the Pacific Northwest and California uh, and a couple of the Great Plains states. And I called up some of the folks from Xerces early this year, I guess it was in spring, and I said, why don't we have something like that in the southeast? We need that here. We don't have enough boots on the ground to see what bumblebee species we have. We know they're declining. How can we make this happen in the southeast? So through a lot of work and a lot of collaboration and many long meetings, we have finally been able to pull together our own bumblebee atlas. It's going to start in the spring of 2023. So copy down that website or we'll drop it in the chat afterwards so that you can enter in your information. And when we know more about trainings, we will email you and let you know where they're going to be, how you can join. Basically, in a nutshell, if you sign up for the Bumblebee Atlas, it's a citizen science project and you commit to going out at least two times a year in a grid cell that you've adopted. You can go out a ton more than two times. And in fact, we hope you do. But two times is the minimum. And you take a camera, it can be the camera on your cell phone, and you just take pictures of all the bumblebees that you see in your grid cell. And then you submit it to a national database and either you can identify it or the professionals in this national database will identify it. But it's going to give us a much better idea of all of the bumblebees that we have in the state. So we can determine if we need to focus on conserving certain areas. Hopefully we'll find some rare species that we didn't think were there anymore. There's so many good reasons to get a better idea of our bumblebee demographics across the state. And this bumblebee atlas is incorporating North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Tennessee. So it's a much wider regional effort than just North Carolina. So like I said, starting in the spring 2023, we're so excited. And I think I'm at my time, which is perfect because I am ready for questions if you have any. Thank you, Gabriella. Um, yeah, really interesting presentation. Um, that, was a, that was a tragic story about the HOA folks squishing the monarch larvae, but um, I, I'm glad it turned into a, a learning opportunity. <laughs> um, and also, the, the New River Hawks, they, they did benefit from the, the milkweed giveaway. Um, they planted them at multiple sites around Wake Forest. So yeah, huge thanks to everyone involved um, who made that happen. I, I know I speak for everyone here. I mean, that was that was really, really cool, even for myself to see all that milkweed um, in the office downstairs. <laughs> um, I got to say, too, I think it was so um, I'm, I'm blanking on a park, but I was at a park in Raleigh this summer and I was working with a youth camp and there was a pollinator garden at this Raleigh park. And I'll go back in my emails and figure out the name. But I'm pretty sure that the park manager said that the Noose River Hawks had um, planted the garden and maintained it and they were there religiously. And I got to tell you, the thing, I've seen a lot of pollinator gardens, but I was really impressed with this one because it had this really large log that was laying in yeah. the garden. The and forest, added, yeah. What's that? Is it Forest Ridge Park? Is that the one? Maybe, I think so. Um, and it had a sign talking about that that was habitat. And I was so excited because mm -hmm. I love pollinator gardens, but most of the time it's flowers and that's fine. That's totally fine. But it's so important to understand that you have to have the, the forage and the shelter. And so for people to see that that was shelter, that that was habitat, it was really cool. So I was I was really impressed with that because I don't see that very often in pollinator gardens. Yeah, if we're talking about the same one, I've, I've been to Forest Ridge quite a few times now. And that one really, that pollinator garden definitely takes my breath away. And I would agree that is just the diversity of, of flowering plants too, but also, you know, the native grasses that serve more as shelter and that yeah, that, that that huge log too. I mean, super cool, super cool, and something you don't really see very often. A lot of times, gardens seem to be manicured to death, but this one really seemed to have the pollinators in mind as priority. Um, well, I guess I'll hop into the chat here. I, I have a few questions, but um, see if some other folks ask some already. Um, so the first one, I guess this isn't related to the the presentation, but. Um, do I hear a bird in your background? If so, can you share a bit about your feathery friend <laughs> or friends? 
yeah. So I, I put my dogs in the back room, but I can't put my bird in the back room. So he is actually a cockatiel. Um, he's about 25 years old. When I was in college, I'm dating myself. When I was in college about 20 plus years ago, I had an internship in the Florida Keys at a wild bird rehab center. And I got a call one day about an injured bird that was in the woods. And I just assumed it was, you know, a, an injured wild bird. And I got there and it was this cockatiel. And it was a day after a really, really bad storm. So we're not sure if he got blown off of a boat or he got blown away from home or, or what his deal was, but nobody claimed him. And he was this cute little cockatiel. So I kept him. <laughs> so that's, that's my friend. That's buddy. <laughs> years old at least we don't know how old he was when I got him but that was about 25 years ago hmm you know I yeah I feel like you should just have the bird right in, in the in the picture there for the presentations but <laughs> <laughs> maybe folks wouldn't wouldn't pay attention to <laughs> the presentation itself but uh so this this next question um how do um how does the bee seal off her chamber what so um what what do bees use to seal off the chamber well, so it kind of depends on the species of bee, and I'll use um, probably one of the more obvious ones. So mason bees, they seal off their chamber with a combination of saliva and mud or some kind of dirt. So if anybody here has a bee hotel, go look at your bee hotel and you'll see that there's different sealings, sealants for a lot of the different tubes. And so resin bees, they use kind of sticky sap, some type of resin. So their seal and their plug rather is gonna look kind of shiny and translucent, transparent. Um, mason bees, they use dirt and their saliva. So it's gonna look like a little dirt plug. Um, leaf cutting bees, they use leaves. And again, it's all mixed with their saliva because that's sort of the glue that holds everything together. But um, if you have a leaf cutting bee in one of your tubes and you're likely gonna see little bits of leaves that are sticking out of the tube. Um, and, and the same that they use for the plug, they'll use for those dividers between each chamber. And I, you know, I always forget to include this. I really like the pictures. If you're ever out in the woods and you look at leaves and there's a perfect little hole carved out of the leaf. Has anybody here seen that? Um, that's, that's evidence that a leaf cutting bee is close by. And it's really cool if you've ever seen one do it, you could Google it and you'll get a video, but they just sit there and using their mandibles, they have really large mandibles and they cut these little circular pieces of leaf. And that's what they use to create the dividers in their cavities and the plug that seals the overall tube. It's pretty neat. Like I said, it depends on the species that you're looking at, um, but it'll be dirt, it'll be leaves, it'll be mud. Yeah, that is really neat. I just learned the other the other day that bald faced hornets they do kind of the same thing. They chew up the wood, mix it with their saliva, and um, use that to build their nests. And do they just keep that in their mouth, or do they fully digest it and like regurgitate it? No. So most of the time they keep it in their mouths, but there are some bees that will bees have a crop kind of similar to a chicken, but not really. And so they'll keep it in their crop, and sometimes they'll regurgitate it. It just again depends on the species. But carpenter bees, they do the same thing. They use their saliva and kind of the sawdust that they use from excavating the wood to create the little divider and the plug in their, um, in their cavities. And it's actually really cool because if you look at the divider that they use, it's almost a piece, it's like a piece of artwork because they have this perfect little cylindrical line that makes up the divider. If you Google it, I'm sure a picture will come up, but it's really beautiful. It's not just like a, a, a dirt and saliva or sawdust and saliva. It, it, it's really quite pretty. Yeah, it was, uh, I think it might've been a webinar with the NC Pollinator Alliance, but it was on carpenter bees and it was showing some, some really great images of um of those like yeah that that perfect like you know symmetrical nesting sites and I think there was something like a lot of it might have been a fly or something as a as a parasite that kind of comes in and takes over <laughs> yeah so I, I didn't really talk too much about this because I was trying to um, stay on target but mm -hmm. they're actually a lot of different types of parasitic bees and wasps and flies and so it's, it's incredibly diverse. And if you have a lot of these parasitic insects, then that's actually a sign that you have a really healthy ecosystem mm -hmm. because it means you have the host to support the parasites. And so this particular fly loop that you're talking about, they'll hover by the entrance of the carpenter bee tunnel and they'll shoot eggs into the tunnel in hopes that it'll get to the pollen ball. 
And a lot of different parasitic insects do this. They'll hover above the hole in the ground or the cavity and they'll shoot the eggs in. And sometimes when the egg hatches, that larva of the parasitic insect will either eat the pollen ball of the actual bee larva or it'll kill the bee larva. I mean, there's a lot of different iterations because again, it's so species specific, but um, it's, it's really quite interesting. There's so much diversity. It's very cool. Yeah, that is fascinating. I'm glad you did point out too that if you have these like parasitic interactions going on, it can be a sign that, you know, you have a healthy ecosystem in your backyard. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Gail has a question. Um, what, what type of milkweed do you suggest? Well, it completely depends on the habitat that you have. And so I've done a lot of presentations just on native plants. And my take home message to people is you have to be really careful of planting what your landscape can support. So for instance, if you had an area that um, maybe had a riparian area or an area leading up to a pond or a little creek, then swamp milkweed, swamp milkweed might be a really good choice because even though it can do okay in more upland areas, it likes wet feet. And so, especially when it gets a little droughty in the summer, swamp milkweed tends to do okay because it's in a wetter area and it can, it can survive the drought. Um, common milkweed kind of seems to do okay anywhere you plant it. I've even planted it in shady areas and it seems to be okay. It doesn't do too well where I live in the sand hills. So that's another thing. What kind of soil do you have? Do you have um, clay soil? Do you have sandy soil? Um, that's something really important to consider because even though I have common milkweed here, it's really hard. It rarely blooms because I think it's just trying to survive the best it can in the sand. So you really have to look at your soil. You have to look at your light conditions because most milkweed likes to have pretty sunny conditions. Um, so if you are in the Raleigh-ish area, I would say butterfly milkweed or Wake County area, butterfly milkweed would do well. Um, common milkweed would do well. World milkweed should do okay. If you have a slightly wetter area, swamp milkweed would be a really good choice. And um, I, I guess I've never done this myself, but you um, you can like send in like a little vial of soil, right? And have that sent back to you in terms of the, exactly what the, the contents are. Yeah, so absolutely, especially if even if, well, so I was going to preface it by saying, especially if you have a larger landscape, but even if you don't, even if it's just your backyard, the NCDA, um, you can send in your soil. And for the most part of the year, it's a free soil analysis. It's just in the busier times, I think in the spring and late winter where you have to pay a fee, but even the fee is only like 10 or $12, but they'll um, analyze it for you and they'll give you a little report and they'll tell you what the pH is because pH really can play a big role in what does well and what doesn't. And um, sometimes too, if the pH is a little wonky, they might give you a suggestion on lime or something to use to adjust the pH, but it's a really great service to take advantage of, especially when it's free most of the year and it sort of gives you a heads up on what you're working with. Mm, absolutely. Um, so do you recommend bee hotels? I don't. <laughs> I, I don't. Well, so, so here's the thing. Um, I like bee hotels from the vantage point that I, it's so fun to watch bees, right? Um, they're kind of like bird feeders. It's really fun to attract them to your yard and to watch them. But here's the thing. They're kind of like bird feeders. So if you don't keep them clean, then they can um, collect bacteria and disease. Remember, we talked about pathogens being a, a really big problem in the insect world. Um, they can draw predators because you have this concentrated um, little blurb of activity that can draw or predatory wasp and parasitic insects. So um, if you want a bee hotel, which is totally fine because they're really fun, you just have to commit to keeping it clean. And so by doing that, I mean changing out the tubes which can be hard because a lot of the bee hotels that you buy in the store have the tubes glued in. But you can find bee hotels that the tubes come in and out. It's a little harder to find them, but I think as we're learning more about bee hotels and how they can get so dirty, people are making it easier to switch out the tubes. So that would be really important. You can make your own bee hotel. So you can get a block of wood and get pieces of bamboo or some kind of natural material and just put them in that block of wood yourself. Um, that would probably be 
better because then it'd be easier for you to switch out the tube. So if you have a bee hotel, just commit to trying to keep it clean and maybe even every couple of years sort of move it around to different areas in your yard so that it's not such a, a central grand station of activity attracting different things. So I guess, I get, so and then here's, here's my little um, plug for natural habitat. There are a lot of things that you can do in your yard to create that same natural habitat for those cavity nesting bees. So that's, this is why I thought that log and, the, and that um, pollinator garden in Raleigh was so cool. A log is a perfect piece of real estate for a lot of those ground, or cavity nesting bees because the wood boring beetles will excavate the little tunnels in it and then the bees go in right after them and use those tunnels in the fall don't cut back your stems, leave all of your stems standing because a lot of those stems can be valuable habitat, especially for overwintering bees. Um, any kind of woody debris, these cavity nesting bees are incredibly resilient and adaptive. So they'll find little hidey holes in the most opportune of spaces. So my vote is usually for you just to try to keep a natural landscape in your yard that provides those cavities for bees without a bee hotel. Because if you think about it, in, the, in nature, in the natural world, there aren't bee hotels. There's the natural habitat that these bees find. And so they're all spread out. And so it minimizes that um, disease load. It minimizes attracting attention from predatory insects that want to eat them. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you, Gabrielle. I've kind of been going through a similar situation with like um, bird feeders and um, it's, it's like, I feel like, I mean, it is a big responsibility to clean them as much as they need to be cleaned. And I've definitely heard a lot of horror stories about zombified birds and, you know, dead birds in people's yards. Um, and it might've been a better, you know, um, endeavor just to plant native plants that could also like, you know, be food sources for, for, for wild well, time. And, and yeah, you know, the thing with bird feeders too, if you think about what I said in the summertime, most birds aren't even looking for seeds. They're looking for insects. So if you right. provide all of those native plants in your mm -hmm. yard, you're providing the insects and that's where the birds are going to go. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so in the chat, we've got a couple votes for a moth program. <laughs> uh, so we'll have to put you up to that at some point. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I love moths. They are so fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, a little more cryptic, but yes, definitely fascinating. Um, so, and then we have a few more questions. Um, what is the purpose of scales on butterflies? I think it's just, a, it's almost like, to, to the best that I understand it, um, it's almost like armor. It provides this really good protection for their bodies because their bodies are so delicate and they do so much work when they're flying because they're constantly flying. So they need this structure on them to keep them intact, to keep them safe. And that's why when I touch, if you touch a butterfly, all these scales will come off because that's their protective coating, I guess, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. So we have a, um, a life cycle question here, it seems like. Um, so, so the female bumblebee only mates once, but can produce babies over the course of the summer from just mating in fall. Correct. So the new queens will be produced in the, let's say fall, just make it easy. New queens will be produced in the fall. They'll leave the colony and they won't go back. Um, and they'll, they'll be looking for forage to fatten up because they're going to be hibernating and they'll be looking for a man because they need to mate. And once they fatten up and once they mate, they can go hibernate. And the rest of the colony, the originating colony where she comes from, they die off. So that's why, you know, come November-ish when the weather starts getting cold, you don't see bumblebees anymore. They're not overwintering. The only thing that's overwintering is that new queen bee that just mated. Everybody else from that original colony dies off, even the males. So she is the only thing left. And then she'll start a new colony the following spring. Gotcha. I had just, just a few more. I don't want to take all your time. But um, so it, it, like it, in your experience with, with public outreach events, events um, what, do you, what do people typically find the most interesting about uh, beneficial insects and pollinators? Um, and now are you talking about a webinar like this or are you talking about like at a bug fest event where you have a table and you have different I would say more like bug fest or the okay. pollinator field day. So what people have really liked what well, a um, doing the netting at the field days people 
love that because it's one thing just to see insects kind of whizzing by your face, maybe landing on a flower. It's a completely different thing to net one, put it in a little vial and be able to identify what it is and to be able to point out different features about it. That, I mean, when you put a name on that insect, it gives a whole new meaning to that insect. So, so being able to up close um, net and handle insects, that's really big. Um, we always have display cases at our table so that people can pick up the pen and look at the bee and then we can talk about the different features and some ways to identify things and talk about why those pollen collecting hairs are important or in my display cases I'll always have a category of bees, flies, and wasps so that we can talk about the differences. There was one year at Bugfest we actually borrowed a live bumblebee colony from NC State and it was so cool because it was like the size of a shoebox, but the top flipped up and then there was like a silicone wall and you could see all of the activity oh, wow. in the colony and people loved it because it, I mean, they want visual aid, right? It's one thing to look at pictures, but people really like to actually see something three-dimensional oh, in yeah. person. So I think, I feel like that's really what draws people in being able to see it because then they overcome sometimes that fear they have like, oh, it's an insect. I don't want to touch it. It's going to sting me. But then you can explain all the things I said, that males don't sting, that most native bees are pretty docile. You have to really harass them to get you. Mm -hmm. to, to you. So it kind of breaks through some of those barriers, I think. Yeah, I have a really good friend taking entomology right now, and it's kind of the same situation. I mean, she's saying how much she's learned just by like actually interacting with you know, the bugs that she sees flying around, but to see them so up close and actually take the time to identify each one, you begin to, I guess, appreciate them a lot more. Um, so uh, I guess it doesn't seem like anyone else has any questions. Um, do you mind if I ask you one more? Oh, go ahead. So um, so when it, when it comes to conserving, you know, pollinators, uh, beneficial insects that are, that are at risk, um, where do you think there are the most gaps in, in, in research? So like what, what really needs to be studied um, if we want to maxim maximize conservation success? Um, you know, I, I feel like, so there is a lot of good research out there. There's uh, on bumblebees because bumblebees are easy, easier, not easy, easier to study because they have a colony that's long lived from the spring through the fall. It's easier to follow them. They're a little slower moving, but all of our other native solitary bees, really hard to study because mm -hmm. you're talking about one species of bee that might only be above the surface for two or three weeks, maybe less than that. And each of these species is 550 species of bees. They're all active at all different times of the season. So some are only active in the spring and some are only active in the fall. Um, and, you know, the females, the males are the most short-lived because their only job is to mate. When they mate, they're done. They die. So they might only be above the surface or out of their cavity for like a week or two. The females, they have a much harder job because they have to provision all the pollen and the nectar for the brood. But even then, they're still in their cavity or under the surface provisioning and digging the tunnel. So with our solitary bees, it's a really hard thing to research because they're they're so elusive um, and so we know that we're seeing a lot of decline we know that we're seeing a lot of decline with bumblebees um, and so we're kind of inferring that we're probably seeing the same decline with solitary bees it's just harder to prove that um, and so the topic about the this relationship this potentially negative relationship with honeybees we've been able to document that in bumblebees but we can't document that in the, in the solitary bees because how in the world do we do that? We can't even right. barely document their population level. So I would say, and it's not that it's research gaps because we don't have enough people looking at it. It's just research gaps because it's really hard to do. It's mm -hmm. really hard to follow around a solitary bee. Um, so we have a pretty good idea of what their life cycles look like, but it would be really nice to know the impact that honeybees are having on them it'd be nice to have a little bit better idea of the impact that some of these pesticides and herbicides are having on some of the solitary bees. Because again, we know we're starting to determine the impact they're having on bumblebees. And so it's probably pretty similar as, as to um, the solitary bees. It's really hard to document. It's really hard to know. So those are some pretty big research gaps, I guess.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, well, thank you very much, Gabrielle. This is really informative for myself, and I'm sure it was for everyone who attended. Um, and yeah, I guess I guess we're all set. Unless there's any other questions, I don't see any more in the Q and A. And um, I mean, I, I had my contact information up there, so if anybody has any questions or follow up, please feel free to email me. Always happy to chat. That sounds great. Thank you very much. You're so welcome, everybody.